Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the first of the two-part ISAS lecture series themed one year into the Sri Lanka Podujana Peramuna Parliamentary Victory. Today's lecture topic is titled Sri Lanka's Domestic, Political and Economic Issues. Before we proceed with the event, I would appreciate it if all participants could mute their microphones when other speakers are in conversation. Do drop your questions into the chat box at any point during the session, as that will help us facilitate the Q&A segment. Today, we are delighted to have with us our guest speaker, Honorable Dio Gunasekara, former cabinet minister and former member of parliament of the government of Sri Lanka. And chairing the discussion will be Dr. Amitendu Palit, Senior Research Fellow and Research Lead, Trade and Economics, Institute of South Asian Studies, National University of Singapore. I now invite Dr. Palit to deliver the opening remarks. Thank you so much, uh, Shavinia. Thank you so much, all distinguished guests and friends who have joined us today for the first part of the lecture series. And thank you most, uh, Honorable Dinasekhar, for sparing your very valuable time and gracing us by your presence. Uh, we are looking forward, sir, to learning from your wisdom on the variety of developments that Sri Lanka currently find itself being a part of, many of which are a product of specific domestic circumstances, but many of which also are a result of the external conditions in which the South Asian region and the rest of the world finds itself in. When it comes to the domestic circumstances, as uh, we would look forward to learning from you, uh, there are uh, very serious concerns about the future growth and development trajectory of the Sri Lankan economy, particularly in view of the uh, recent uh, developments with respect to food emergency and uh, the factors with respect to the management of the budget and the external debt that the Sri Lankan economy has been struggling for some time. There are also concerns and to which Sri Lanka is not unique in terms of how uh, the country will be able to adjust to the challenges that have been brought on by COVID-19. And the COVID-19 being a pandemic which is really creating challenges and questions for public policy authorities at every bend of its progression. There is considerable uncertainty, understandably, uh, in uh, Sri Lanka, a country which is quite dependent upon its external linkages with the rest of the world in so far as its economic well-being and prosperity is concerned. And finally, there is also the question of the larger domestic political environment within the country. This is one year after the Sri Lankan elections were held. And today we are, if not at a crossroads, we are certainly at a point in time when we can look back and reflect upon what the specific conditionalities are in so far as the domestic political context is concerned and also the larger overall external economic milieu is concerned in which the Sri Lankan people, the Sri Lankan economy and Sri Lankan institutions will be tested as they go ahead in the foreseeable future. So with these words, Honorable Gunasekara, it is my great pleasure to welcome you to today's discussion again on behalf of the Institute of South Asian Studies in the National University of Singapore. May I now hand over the flow to you, sir, for your speech and remarks. Thank you so much. Okay. Good afternoon, Chairman Dr. Patil. Ladies and gentlemen, at the outset, let me express my deep appreciation and profound thanks for your kind invitation to today to address you. And it's a great pleasure and a privilege. And to begin with, 
if I have been assigned the subject of the first year, one year's performance of Gota by Rajavaksa government. At the moment, I am not a part of the government, but anyway, I have been supporting him at the elections. And uh, uh, I wish within the time allocated to me, I try to be as concise but comprehensive. Uh, if time doesn't permit, I think the, I'll be in a position to answer you whenever the questions are raised, to clarify matters. Firstly, to begin with, Gautabha Rajapaksa was elected executive president in November 2019. And the elections, general elections, were held in August 2020. The general elections could not be held on the due date as COVID intervened in the beginning of 2020. As you all know, that China announced the uh, outbreak of COVID-19 on 31st December 2019. And the first infection in our country was detected in January. And she happened to be a Chinese tourist. Anyway, we treated her and sent him back. Our local infection we discovered in the in March. It was he was a tourist guide. Immediately when the outbreak was announced, the president got up at Rajabaksa, decided upon to set up a presidential task force to combat this situation. And the first wave we were managed, we control it with 10, 11 deaths, we managed to control it. And then the elections were held in August. On the election, Gautabha Rajavaksa secured a two third majority in parliament in August, 2020. And although he was selected, his parliament was elected in uh, August, 2020, the COVID second wave started in December and we were confronted with a lot of problems. First thing is that Dr. Uh, Gautabha Rajabaksa had a caretaker government for nine months. At the start, also he had a rival opposition, but after the dissolution of the parliament, he had to carry on regardless uh, as a, the care, caretaker government until the elections are held. During that time, there was, there was, there was no budget uh, for the year 2020, but the previous government had not passed the budget. And there's only a vote of vote on account that token on current expenditure was, had been passed. So uh, the president was confronted with this problem and he would not do anything, start nothing. He allowed the ongoing projects to go on. And after the elections, the, then the second wave came somewhere in March, uh, May, and that was controlled. It took about three months. And we had uh, two lockdowns. Then we were about to lift the lockdown, the new year, and Hindu single and new year, Hindu new year intervened in April. Since the previous year, New Year was not uh, held really, where the people were deprived of the opportunity to celebrate it, the president was uh, kind enough to allow the people to celebrate it. The outcome was the third wave came. And third wave, we are still struggling with the third, third wave of COVID-19. Now, although this first wave, it ended up with, with 11 deaths. Second wave, it ended up with 199 deaths. And today, the third wave, by yesterday, uh, deaths, it was, it came about uh, uh, 
infection were 450,000 infections and 4,000 or deaths. So we are still struggling, but only thing I we find that there's a downward trend is emerging because from yesterday, the death trend, the trend started slowing down. Also infections are slowing down. So our medical experts, they anticipate that uh, by about mid-October, I think third wave might come to an end and we will be able to uh, lift the lockdown. In the meantime, this is what has happened as far as the COVID-19 is concerned. But uh, in my view, the, the government made of two fundamental mistakes in handling the COVID-19. The first thing is that uh, contrary to the WHO uh, prescriptions to give the vaccine at the over six to 60 years age, the highest priority, uh, the government decided to give it to over 30 years of age. And as a result, what happened was that of the people, of the deaths, about 90% of the people who had not taken vaccine and 86% of the people who are over 60 years. The, the unfortunate situation. Yeah. The other, the second, that is the one thing, the underestimation. Uh, I, uh, the, the second thing is that uh, uh, the, uh, in, in tackling the COVID, we had the public health system in our country. We can be proud of that system. I think like almost similar to that of a developed country, it's a public sector, the health uh, scheme coming from since independence. We are setting about a lot of money for free health services. So normally in the case of uh, pandemic uh, or epidemic, uh, the, uh, the modus operandi should have been uh, not to combat it from centrally from one center, uh, but to get the support of the people. And it's a people's oriented. Uh, we had the machinery because we have 25 districts and we have for 340 regional areas. And we got about 14,000 village areas and easily at the grassroots level. Uh, with the participants of people, uh, we should have been uh, more conveniently uh, combat the situation. That is my view. Uh, going uh, according to the, I mean, even the medical science uh, itself uh, teaches us that in the case of a uh, epidemic, it cannot be eliminated unless and until the people people support it fully. So that, that is one of the lapses, two lapses that I observe is that. But the, the cost of COVID is uh, alarming. The, already the amount of money that we have spent on the COVID, this amount to, uh, is it can it be still only an estimate, uh, roughly it's over and above one year's government revenue. Then the, as far as the COVID-19 is concerned, that is what all I have to mention. But the more important thing, the impact of the COVID on the economy. Therefore, the, I, I would like to touch up on the economy as, a, and as uh, in my lineup. Uh, now, economy, unless you have a background information of our economy, the history of our economy from independent downwards, uh, it will be not be possible to comprehend uh, the, the real ground realities. So the really in 1948, uh, when we achieved independence, that, uh, prior to independence, the, the, uh, the, then the state council, they voted money only for recurrent expenditure. No development, no welfare, nothing. This under the colonial system. But after the independence, the, the first few years, say from 1948-56, uh, there was provision for development and capital expenditure was introduced into the budget for the first time in 1948. And we started 
developing our own economy, but we had a plant. Plantation economy, we had a surplus in the reserves. There was nothing alarming. So the, the, the then government, of course, carry on regardless, spending lavishly. And, and uh, we faced a crisis somewhere in uh, 1952. Anyway, we had, and there was a revolt in the country. Uh, people rose up against the rising prices. Uh, that was the first regime. Then the 1956, the regime changed. So it's really from liberal democracy to it was passed on to the social democracy with Bandar Nag as prime minister in 1956. And there are the but within a matter of three years, he was assassinated and he could not pursue. And there was again changes. And finally, the Mrs. Bandar Nag followed in 1960. And between 1960 and 1977, that period, although despite changes uh, of government, the, it was a import substitute economy basically. We shifted from plantation economy gradually. Industrialization started taking place. Domestic production started taking, taking place. It went on. And then in 1977, uh, the era of uh, liberal, liberal, liberalization of the economy uh, ensued. And the new regime, Jaya Jajana, started the open economy the regime in 1978. And today, 43 years have elapsed since 1978. Uh, we have this uh, liberal economy. All trade has been liberalized, exchange has been liberalized, and uh, private, uh, national license project to all privatized. Uh, everything was done. And uh, during the last 43 years, see that you'll have to analyze the economic trends and we find, particularly today we are in a very bad situation. We are, we, our foreign debt is about $35 billion and the domestic uh, debt is about 15 trillion rupees. And uh, so we have a balance of payment deficit there's a budget deficit. Uh, then we have a savings are at a low stay, about 20 to 20%. And the public investments about 5 to 6%. Private investment investment is about 28 to 30. And in spite of, although we introduced uh, liberalization at the end of after 43 years, today, instead of uh, an export economy, we are left with the import economy. Our exports are out almost double. Uh, imports are almost double the exports. And therefore, there's a there's foreign exchange reserves are depleted. You know, in the meantime, we had the, you know, unfortunately, and fight the entire war in 1983, from 83 to 2009. In spite of the war, we were able to secure a uh, uh, moderate uh, rate of growth, say five to six percent, and then from after end of the war, it went up to eight, seven, eight percent growth, and we doubled the GDP, we doubled the per capita income, but again now the declining started somewhere in 2014. So, what are the, the important point that I want to stress is that. In 1977, our GDP, our government revenue was 24% of the GDP. By 2019, the last regime, it was just come down to 6%. And today, I think minus 6%, I don't know, it may be 0 or 1%. So the biggest, one of the biggest problems that we are facing is the government revenue. So this, this has a history of its own. We have, because the fiscal policy that we have been following has at least has brought in these disastrous results because now we had 14 M tax amnesties during this period. And um, we had wealth tax, gift tax, expenditure tax, 
and capital gains tax, estate duty, all abolished in 1977. And we were left all with the corporate tax and income tax. And the government under all regimes, under, under all the seven presidents in power, executive president, the government has revenue has been dwindling from 24% to minus 6%. So domestically, in the domestic economy is one of the challenging tasks that we face the government revenue. I was a minister, I was an MP, and I fought within the government, outside the government, from, from the beginning against this fiscal policy. About the, I noticed the dwindling government revenue, uh, could not persuade my colleagues, but anyway, today they are repenting. Uh, it has come down. Now the export side, the President Jawadhan announcing the, the liberalization said that my wish is to have an export economy. And all tax holidays, tax reliefs, tax concessions, everything was given about FDI, but compared to under all dispensation, under all precedents, there wasn't sufficient foreign development of uh, FDIs. Uh, that is, then we are, in the whole history of 73 years from independence, we had only once a surplus budget in 1954. And that is not to the credit of the then finance minister, but he, said he cut down the expenditure and showed a surplus. <laughs> that is what really happened. But really speaking, it was a deficit budget throughout. Can you believe that all the 73 years we have had deficit budgets? Then also we had our balance deficit framed and balance of payment deficit. So finally, the, all these things are reflected in the government debt, government debt. So that is a, the challenge, challenge that we are facing. On the top of it, the COVID came and it is an unbearable challenge, uh, impact on the economy. And uh, because in our economy, we have 14% of the public sector employees and the highly uh, uh, Formalized private sector companies and others, we got 26%, and the balance 60% belongs to the informal economy. And this informal economy is the worst hit sector of the economy under COVID 19. A large number of people are without jobs, and the cost of living has risen uh, gradually, it's going up. Uh, and, uh, so the, the and this is a, this is the, the situation that the Gotaba Rajabaksa had to face when he assumed duties as ex president. To keep you informed that now Gotaba Rajabaksa is the first executive president who was not a politician. I be, I believe in my view I still say he is not a politician. He was a government official. He was an ex army man, and uh, so. Uh, so that is uh, probably to his benefit or to his, his, uh, to his disadvantage, I do not know. But certain uh, economic issues where we have not been able to uh, last one year and to handle properly. And uh, because since there was no budget, even 2021, the budget was a nominal budget. There was nothing uh, special to be mentioned about the budget. So therefore, the government has announced now that the 2022 budget is the real budget and we are expecting the new, if at all, if there's going to be a new uh, economic uh, uh, policy, the fis new fiscal policy or new monetary policy, new taxation, tax, tax policy, we all have are waiting to see when the budget in, in uh, where budget proposals are tabled in, uh, in the month of November. So uh, really speaking, the economic uh, strategy in 1977 continued to operate 
in spite of changes of government. That is a central factor that I would like to emphasize. Although there were changes in the government, the, the, the economic strategy never changed. There were modifications here and there, but basically it was that. So therefore, and uh, I mean, all the governments are equally responsible, although they belong to the a camp of liberal democracy or the social democracy. And for this pathetic situation, uh, including myself, who was part of the government for a few years as a minister, uh, so we are ill responsible for the situation. Now we'll, let her, we'll have to revisit the whole thing today. That's it. From my point of view, I think we have to have a change in the economic strategy. Because there's no domestic production, completely it was open. And we have, then what happened was we unrestricted imports, flooded the market, and consumerism. If you, when you take all the private banks and state banks, they, they invest, I mean, the, the loans that they have given are for consumption, trade and consumption. Agriculture only for 4%, industry is only 4%, only for trade. So there's a big trading class is there. And, and on the top of it, like in the world, in the world economy, the finance capital thrives on the top of it. So this is the economic regime that we are facing, uh, that we are, we are, we are settled with. So we'll have to think of some old role. Now there's a big discussion going on in the country among the economists, within the government and within the opposition. The, the main two parties are divided, as you all know. The original parties of the UNP is completely divided. The, 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 the party which uh, brought in independence in 1948 is totally in disarray. Uh, the, the Sri Lankan Freedom Party, which was uh, brought to power by Stabdu Arivandar Nayaka, also it has split and a new party uh, came into our uh, government. Of course, it's an offshoot of the SLFP under Mahindra Rajapaksa. So the regime shows how it changed. Now, now the situation in the country remains unchanged. So we'll have to think of some new strategy. That is my view. And this discussion is open discussion is going on at the moment. Now to get over this debt problem, how can we? We have already 35, I said for India, debt is about 35 billion. And every year we'll have to set apart about two to three billion as repayment. Now, then you take the uh, trade uh, Raja foreign exchange rate. In 1977, it was eight rupees per dollar. Today it is 204 rupees per dollar after 43 years of liberalization. This depreciation has helped only the, really the finance capital and no one else, both foreign and local. And therefore, uh, overall, the macroeconomic fundamentals are completely in disarray. And uh, so we'll have to have a new thinking. So the discussion is going on in the country, all the economy and the economics. In the meantime, the debt question has come whether we should go to IMF for bailout, because we have been going to IMF about uh, 18 times we have gone to IMF. Uh, twice, of course, one on the global financial crisis time, we got some, some aid, and the tsunami, we got some aid. Other than that, other 16 years, every government finally had to go for bailout to the IMF. So it has now come how to, IMF also not in the same position as it was. The world has changed. The Asian economy is uh, the uh, well ahead of the, uh, the rest of the economies. And today, the complete, uh, complete new uh, economic uh, order in the world economic order, and you know, new economic uh, balances of power. Uh, so a lot of changes have taken place. So I think. Uh, and worldwide also, I believe, in my view, candid opinion, neoliberalism has failed at world scale and domestically, we all it has failed and 
we are suffering of that. So we have thinking of some alternative, some adjustments uh, as far as the economy is concerned. Then coming to the political side, political side, uh, because it is new regime after it come, one year's performance. I, as I said, I, we could not do something substantial, but even in the ongoing projects continue to operate. But President has taken some initiatives with regard to the constitutional reforms, uh, election reform, uh, laws reforms, and also educational reforms. Uh, and also the climate change, I think uh, we are very far, going fast ahead. Uh, with, with, we are getting the, the entire country is behind that uh, climate project, including opposition, all the political parties. So the government has, uh, uh, need, need not have any second thought. He is getting the backing of the entire uh, country and uh, in keeping with the pledges to the United Nations, uh, I think uh, we are far ahead of the other developing countries as the climate change is concerned, uh, frustration, uh, and then we are shifting from coal power to uh, yeah, other energies, uh, um, wind, and, wind, and, uh, wind power and uh, solar power, uh, a lot of changes are Then the, we started the new, uh, 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 new infrastructure development uh, beast because the, it is Mahindra, President Mahindra Rajvaksa who really the initiated the infrastructure development because no other previous president had ever touched upon the infrastructure that was, we were lagging behind. And today, of course, uh, uh, we are far ahead in as far as uh, road and rail uh, infrastructure development. So we are going, we are, all those things are involved with, with foreign aid. Uh, there's no problem as far as uh, foreign exchange is concerned. So uh, the political side, side uh, we have, the president has two third majority, no doubt. Uh, but uh, still, they, they have not decided upon what the economic strategy is going to be. So that is, I am, I am unable to comment on it because I can give, only express my views. We have to wait the 2022 budget. In fact, the finance minister, the minister has called for uh, views of all the political parties. He has sent a message to me also to send our proposals. Uh, we will we want to watch and see what he is going to do, whether he is going to follow the same path, or we are going to make any adjustments, or whether he is going to take an alternative path, we do not know. I am unable to uh, speak on behalf of my hands since I, belong, I am not in the part of the government, but I know what is happening and all the, uh, the rest of it. And uh, the economic, the international factor, it has uh, also bearing on our economy. Both the world economy is uh, in a recession, in a downturn, as, uh, because our exports are dependent on Europe and America. Uh, so uh, as far as foreign exchange uh, concerns, completely, uh, it has uh, completely, it has completely changed during this last 43 years. Our main foreign uh, remittance uh, source is today uh, uh, worker remittance from the Middle East. That is number one. The second is the exports, agricultural exports and industrial exports. And third is tourism. This is only a still a meager amount, about 2 billion rupees. And uh, total uh, foreign exchange is about 15 billion rupees. The president wants to increase it uh, to 20 billion immediately. Uh, he has taken a uh, lot of steps at the moment, but the COVID intervened and I don't think during this period we will be able to we will realize uh, this is uh, in, a, in a short way. If I cover the entire area within the uh, time that allocated to, to, to me, uh, I will try to give a picture for you to, uh, from your point of view, you will be in a position to advise us and with your own experiences uh, as what we should do. We are just at the moment in that uh, 
uh, wave length. Uh, but I have my own views on the whatever which I have been fighting for uh, in the inside the government, inside the cabinet, inside the parliament. And I was a chairman of the public accounts committee for five years. So I know the internal finances of the all government department and institutions. It is I who detected the great central bank robbery. Uh, <laughs> still it's, uh, you know, it's been now it's uh, in before courts. Uh, we had a lot of corruptions because they are, you know, bad fraud. The commission of Inland Revenue is still, one of the commissioners are still in jail. The vet, the vet fraud. Uh, we, we introduced the vet the tax in, in place of turnover tax. And vet, it was a very good tax for uh, people to rob. For the, even the officials and the taxpayers both got together. And with the lawyers and accountants, they rob some billions of rupees. The tax amnesties we lost income. Tax frauds we lost in income, then central bank robbery we all lost income. These are some of the negative developments, some side days inside. So uh, this is the uh, in the course of our question and answers. What I have, may have left out, uh, I, am, I will be in a question to expand on those further if you want to uh, clarify certain things. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, um, Dr. Patil, thank you very much. This is uh, within the time uh, elegant to me. Uh, I think uh, I have provided you with sufficient ammunition for you to fire. <laughs> Sir, thank you so much. This uh, is actually a very, very informative, illustrative, and at the same time, a very illuminating description of uh, what the challenges are facing Sri Lanka. And I think the best part of what you brought to our notice is the fact that you explain the background under which uh, these, uh, this variety of challenges have taken their current shape. And you put it in the perspective of the latest uh, challenge that has uh, emerged uh, for the country, which is basically the COVID-19 pandemic. And you have also alluded to what the Sri Lankan government is experiencing in terms of the dilemmas that are there with respect to moving forward and engaging with the International Monetary Fund, the challenge of reviving exports, the question of finances, uh, the reality of living with COVID-19 and yet trying to get a very substantial degree of economic recovery in the pipeline and the momentum. I think these are all very fundamental. And so we will uh, come back to you with greater uh, scrutiny from you in terms of the points that you have raised. I have a couple of questions uh, which I'd like to discuss with you. But before that, uh, let me just uh, take this opportunity. Uh, to mention that from the Institute of South Asian Studies, we are very warmly welcoming and we are very happy to have Her Excellency Ms. Sashikala Premawatani, High Commission of Sri Lanka uh, to Singapore to today's program. And at the same time, we are as much delighted to have with us Mr. S. Chandra Das who is the non-resident High Commissioner of Singapore to Sri Lanka and also a member of the IASAS Management Board. Thank you so much, Your Excellency, Ms. Pramavadhane. Thank you so much, uh, Honorable Mr. Chandradas, sir, for being here with us today. Your presence, both of your presence, are greatly inspiring for this program and we look forward to engaging with you in detail. Honorable Gunasekara, if I could come back to the content of what you laid out before us. I wanted to uh, start with a fundamental question that, you know, as an economic manager, as a policy manager, uh, the number of challenges that Sri Lanka faces is very large. And probably the optimal approach at this stage would be to see 
or rush into a large number of challenges at the same time, because many of them might be equally pressing. But I think from a manager's perspective, again, and also from a political perspective, you'd have to take a call on prioritizing these challenges and probably give more importance to the ones which are relatively more pressing, or if I could describe it that way, the worst among the worst, you know, or the worst among the worst, and then develop a plan or a strategy for tackling this. So if you are to take a call, what do you think would be the two biggest challenges that the Sri Lankan government should focus on right now? Foreign exchange crisis, foreign exchange, the men and the government. My highest priority is these two. Highest priority. All other things are in just on that, those two factors. Foreign exchange. Because exports, we expected export economy, we are ended, we are ended up with the import economy. And there was no domestic production. So there's now a lot of uh, discussion going on among the economists, even today's paper carried uh, in our country. And they say, lift all restrictions on imports. There's one school of thought. Uh, the, the president has not really removed, or, I mean, the impose all restrictions, certain essential items, uh, non-essential items uh, if imposed and tried to restrict because of the foreign exchange. There, there's no other solution. Because the government now we have, as far as loans are concerned, what are our sources of uh, loans? We go to IMF, we go to World Bank, we go to ADB, then we go to government, government, government loans and assistance or whatever it is. Then we go to international market. 45% of our debt really is through we have obtained through international finance market. Government only to Japanese uh, 10% and China 10%. Then IMF and all other things, the balance. So therefore, even if you go to IMF, today the IMF, all, most, most of the economists agree that the, econ the IMF, as it was earlier, is not in a position to substantially help us. But in a, I, I know I have been one who has been fighting against. Well, I prepare to get loans, but don't insist on these structural adjustments and political conditions. That is my view. Um, we have suffered enough uh, austerities and various other things. Uh, so the other facilities, which I don't mind going to. Now this debate is also going on. So foreign exchange is now we from British time. We are selling tea to Europe and America. No other. We have not diversified our, uh, diversified our exports. Although we have export development and all institutions are there. So we said, now the, and the world economy has changed. And where, where is money? Money, we know. East, East Asia. I have been advising if you have a good tea leaf. There's a big market in China or any other in Asian countries. Our the best tea. So our research people have much further very good. I mean, these are uh, ways of uh, different, very ways of doing things. So for in exchange, in answering to your question, my priorities are foreign exchange and government revenue. Government revenue is a deliberate I think I mean completely the fiscal policy has been distorted. And to, you know, we had upper bracket, we had 70% uh, tax, income tax in, uh, in even the British time. Today, it is 14%. 14% <laughs> <laughs> So how can I, and what, what the result, what happened was, we increased indirect tax and put the burden on the consumer, the both people, and direct tax was reduced to 15%. So therefore, we'll have to 
I mean, three think about the whole taxation policy. Then the foreign exchange, the exports, we'll have to, our tourism, of course, now the doors have been open, we'll have to, new areas, we'll have to go and find out. Uh, so I now said your question, these are my priorities are these two. Maybe you can advise us yeah. and we have to accept. No, that that uh, is a very uh, interesting, honorable domestic order that uh, you point out the access to foreign exchange and obtaining it as uh, probably the topmost criteria and uh, priority as far as trade and trade is concerned. But this is where I wanted to probe you a little further. Uh, you mentioned the 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 loan profile that the Sri Lankan uh, economy has had over the last five to six years, 45% or almost half of the loans obtained from the international credit markets and often carrying rates of interests or coupon rates, which are, which are quite high. So that has led to uh, the inevitable debt servicing problems. Now, also, as you very rightly pointed out, organizations like the IMF at this uh, point in time are probably not in a position to support Sri Lanka and its foreign exchange requirements the way uh, it should be supported. Now, in that case, what are the options for Sri Lanka? Because uh, intuitively speaking, what is probably required is a loan or a concessional assistance, which really brings in a lot of foreign exchange liquidity to the Sri Lankan treasury at this point in time, because we are aware of the fact that the foreign exchange situation is uh, so tight that the government has had to stop imports of certain food items uh, in, in food emergency uh, proclamation. So where might it be possible for Sri Lanka to obtain the foreign exchange that it wants. Uh, you mentioned raising exports, but raising exports are going to take some time. And of course, during the COVID-19 pandemic and a number of other issues, they might take more time than usual. But what might be the source for Sri Lanka to quickly obtain a sufficient amount of necessary foreign exchange for it to tide over its current crisis? Sir? Yeah, I agree with you. I have nothing to mention. Uh, no, you know, I, now I, when I was in the government, I was in parliament, I was part of I, I discovered that I smelled that most of our exporters, when they export, they retain sizable person, about 25% retain abroad. They don't bring to the country. And yesterday I was told by the deputy finance minister, they have got a that last year, 1.2 billion not remitted to Sri Lanka. This last few months, 800 million altogether, 2 billion is lying there because as speculators, exporters have become speculators. The rupee is going down, and uh, dollar is the, they are buying and selling dollars. So, this is another thing which has come out. I have been throughout in the cabinet and outside, they uh, try to get at least, so they, the government last budget reduced the rate of from exporters tax from 24, 28% to 14. Still they are not bringing. Sir, another question in this context, and I think a question that uh, has often come up in the, in the connection to Sri Lanka's uh, economic journey over the last five to six years. And that is uh, Sri Lanka's uh, economic relationship with China. Uh, China has been a large infrastructure investor in uh, Sri Lanka. Now, I, outside of that, uh, what we have seen over the last five to 10 years is that China has increasingly become a fairly prominent source of development finance as far as the rest of the world is concerned. And if we look at this entire availability of development finance as a market, then probably we can come to the view that this market was traditionally being dominated by the 
G7 and the Paris Club of Donors and some amount of Western, um, Western dominated multilateral institutions to which China has brought in a different alternatives. Now, there have been a large amount of controversies surrounding conditionalities or the lack of conditionalities, transparency or the lack of transparency. But do you feel that at this point in time, given the conditions that, that Sri Lanka is in, a country like China could probably be uh, possibly among the best options for Sri Lanka to access as far as foreign exchange is concerned? Infrastructure development, of course, that is a really, a, because no country has come forward and uh, immediately out of the war, and Mahindra Rajavaksa and uh, took that sort of bold steps, and and that is, that is really Spain today. You know, we, with the infrastructure, road development and rail development, a lot of avenues have been open, and industries, uh, uh, SME sector has widened. A uh, lot of uh, benefits are there. So uh, China, as far as the, in no other country, I am expecting. Uh, British government gave some for the Mahavali River in, in 1983, uh, some assistance. Other than that, no other country gave. They gave only uh, you know, loans. Uh, for instance, Japan gave in a big way. Uh, after that, uh, you know, uh, the, our response was that we increase uh, their exports almost twice or four times. But the assistance uh, is coming down. <laughs> this at all. So whether I China or Japan, we'll have to take precautionary measures. You know, I have to try. Uh, uh, China, as far as now China, what a, there are two, three types of loans that China offers, government to government. Then there are some uh, uh, donations are there. That consists in loan 1% interest. Then Chinese banks and companies, 5-6% to interest. That's Either so you can either take or give it. I mean, this is the world reality, whether you want like or not. If there's no other, now we are we are we got some soft from India. We even Bangladesh came to our assistance. Bangladesh gave some soft, some 300 million rupees, uh, million ru rupees. No other country is prepared to add the, I mean, that is the reality of the world situation. I told you. So therefore that is. So China, it's not the case of that we are going after China. That is the reality of the world. Yeah. As much as in 1940s, we were going after UK. After that, we are going after US, uh, Japan. Then they're going after US. Then the people are going after China. So it is not, if the Americans can invest in China, why can others can do too? Uh, I mean, you must understand how China came into the question. One must uh, study the Chinese economy. How what 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 uh, how they came to this position? Number of fact, I mean, they say their saving rate is fifty to sixty percent. Our saving rate is twenty percent. I have been fighting with the government. At least have a campaign. Get every every child to contribute one rupee per day. At the end of the year, you get and put in the savings bank. And these are simple things. So people are spending money, spending. To be consumerism at its height beyond our control, consumerism. So that it has not paid. But we are only passing the burden out of the next generation, and we vanished. That is what has happened. Sir, I think uh, this this is actually a a reality which uh, many many commentators often overlook. That uh, of course countries find themselves in economic crisis and economic difficulties. But uh, we, we must uh, probably understand that when we look at a country like Sri Lanka, which is an economy with, uh, with tremendous potential, but with a small size as far as the domestic market is concerned. And also the fact that uh, there are a number of occasions where Sri Lanka probably has to rely uh, relatively more on the external world for its own economic prospects as opposed to those countries which have bigger domestic markets. 
and as a result are probably capable of generating more internal stimulus within themselves. Now, on this, actually, I wanted to come back to the second point that you mentioned in terms of high priorities. And you mentioned uh, the importance of mobilizing government revenues. Now, this is where, sir, I wanted to uh, check out with you that, you know, uh, economic management faces this dilemma that unless uh, economic growth increases, it is difficult for government revenues to come in. But then at the same time, policies cannot typically always be counter-cyclical in the sense that if economic growth is increasing. And if the government takes that opportunity to increase taxes, then in the next round of economic growth, there might be a cutback as far as the growth cycle is concerned. So there is this view that, look, let economic growth take place, let it stabilize, but at the right time to increase taxes, let the, yeah, let the resources be mobilized, let the surpluses be mobilized, let they be invested, and then you wait to capitalize the returns. But the problem there might also be that that doesn't serve the government's immediate purpose of filling the coffers. So if, if you are now looking at it from the government of Sri Lanka's perspective, what would be your suggestion, sir? Should there be a focus on just generating high growth, forgetting about the tax rates, or do you want a different strategy? I, yes. I agree. I agree with you. But I'll give you some statistics from our, our performance. From 2005 to 2015, economy, it doubled. GDP doubled. Per capita income doubled. Correspondingly, government revenue came down. How do, how do you account for that? At least, say, I'm not asking you to freeze it, but I mean, the com as in, com in corresponding there should be an increase in government revenue. You can't import government revenue. You know, I agree that uh, we, we investors investors are given tax holidays, tax reliefs, tax concession, everything on earth is given. That's about the 14% tax. And we, I mean, no, they never asked for 14%. No chamber of commerce came and asked the government bring it down to 14. They know the reality. Sometimes these things have been done for with political motives or in their own personal interests. I'm telling you that way. There's no reason for you to bring food from 28% to 14%. If you tell me one country where the upper most upper bracket is 14% in the world, except in Sri Lanka. No other country. Either the developing world or the developed world. So these are. So no object is subject to factors, not object to factors. I agree with you as far as objective conditions are you must allow the growth way. If you don't have the order of growth, then you can get the, you can't get the tax out of the surplus. I agree fully, there's no question. But he has some completely distorted now. Disturb, disturb. So that is why. So this is basically going back to Sri Lanka's history and uh, looking at the fact that historically, Sri Lanka is an economy where people have been somewhat frustrated by the lack of economic opportunities, sufficient economic opportunities. And probably such frustrations have led to social tensions, including their being uh, aggravated into much larger scale of social violence. Now, it is, it is understood, we all acknowledge the fact that uh, social issues, and particularly when they are taking the shape of uh, social conflicts, do have an economic logic behind them on most occasions. Yes. Perhaps yes. for a few people, perhaps for a few people at this point in time, uh, given the kind of uh, crisis that the Sri Lankan economy is uh, looking at and the difficulties it is facing, perhaps this apprehension is beginning to slowly take some shape in the minds of some people that would this current crisis or the challenges that the government faces, and it's, it's really going to take a lot for the government uh, to overcome the difficulties that they're facing, 
might this create conditions that are conducive for further social and political unrest in Sri Lanka? How do you view that? Yes, wait, 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 wait. I, I, I'm a worried about that. I said, uh, but you know, from 1980, the last general strike was in 1980. After 1980, there had not been a general strike in our country. There have been small uh, uh, stoppages here and there. So the working class, complete. There is another story. You know, organized working class is reduced to from one million to say to to two hundred thousand by way of you know contract labor and various other contrivances. Uh, uh, it has been completely the working class organizers have been destroyed by the by the all the governments. So that is. That is a blessing for them. So there's a but social tensions might arise, but ours is a highly, you know, literacy rate is high, ninety percent, ninety-five percent, right? And university education top level. We got about seventeen universities. Uh, now I have been uh, as a minister. I formulated a human resources policy and gave it to the government. Of course, the government lost and had to pack up and go. It could not. The present uh, governor central bank with uh, my uh, person who wrote my uh, for uh, human resources policy, and we I had the, all the university vice chancellors, all the secretaries, key ministries, and discussed for two years and prepared because it's, we, people are talking about the education policy. It's not an education policy. What matter? We must have a comprehensive human resources policy. Education. Education, primary education, secondary education, tertiary education, then, then the technology, vocational training, all combined as a comprehensive system and geared to the economy. We have only one university which is geared to the economy, the one the Morto University. You, you pass out and immediately the companies absorb them. So th th this is one of the uh, areas where now the president has appointed educational reforms and they are going through it. And these are some of the basic, basic uh, changes that we have to make. Uh, you know, because you take education separately and the economy outside. That's that means. Today, you can't. It's part of the economics. Part of the economy. So the, the social tension, as we, I, I agree, because we had the two insurrections, one in 1971. Of course, they were political motivated insurrections, not, not due to social tension as such. And the second one is uh, in 1988. That is uh, uh, the single chauvinism against uh, Tamil terrorists. As uh, it, it burst up, it's uh, not a, I don't consider that as a social tension. It is politi completely politically motivated. But I agree with you, if the situation persists, the likelihood of social tensions. That is why, because you, you can't, with the indirect, indirect access to 85%, 90%, and the direct access is only 15%. I mean, no, even the, the biggest capitalists never ask for this. I don't know why government is offering it. What they do, they don't ask. <laughs> I mean, they understand. All the business people, they don't, I mean, they have knowledge, they know, know how the people who are running businesses. Got, got you, sir, on that. I think that is something which uh, really, really is, uh, is worth looking at very, very closely. But if I could just uh, take this opportunity to, uh, to have your thoughts on something slightly different. And this is a question that has been asked by uh, one of our participants in the chat box. That uh, right now there is uh, an economic emergency status in Sri Lanka. Essential food supplies are being rationed. In this kind of a situation, uh, there is some thought that is being shared with respect to the 100% organic farming policy that President uh, Raja Paksa had, uh, had uh, articulated. And uh, perhaps one of the thoughts in this regard could be that going ahead, if this is something which the government focuses on, then the 
dependence on food imports will also slowly start reducing over, over the medium term probably but organic farming is not a very easy activity to pick up and implement at that scale but nonetheless it is something which can uh, probably have the potential to turn around sri lanka's food economy by a substantial part so what, what are your thoughts on that sir uh, i i am inclined to agree with you to some extent it's a too sudden decision i am not in favor of that sudden decision to abruptly you know put it down is impossible people who have been used for about 50 long years and uh, uh, so there are it's it's have been uh, implemented gradually uh, you have to educate yeah. the people i can remember even the introduction of this uh, uh, other kaavadik uh, uh, people in the our village uh, agricultural officer used to go and educate people at that time people are refusing oh, the fertilizer so we have to so similarly the other way about we have to educate the farmer and uh, gradually implement it uh the, i i am inclined to believe that this might have an impact on the economy the the production might uh, come down then no they, they will realize that the other thing uh, is the regarding the the food prices and the emergency emergency because i i uh, they blown out of proportion people don't know but really what happened really happened in the price of sugar duty was 50 50 rupees the government brought it down to 25 cents anticipating that the, the benefit would pass over to the consumer and what happened was during the time of the this covid few sugar importers they imported some for sugar we, 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 uh, import of uh, quantity of sugar for next one and a half years and dumped them in their warehouses and then created suddenly shadow so overnight price of sugar went up to from say 85 plus 80 cents 90 cents from 100 rupees to 200 and the people are shouting and the on streets and lagarding government and now there there was no other uh, Government has no other step to take except in using emergency powers. That emergency power will be lifted in a minute after the COVID. Today there is an emergency debate going on uh, in the parliament today. So that's not a something which will continue because there is no other way to combat this for hoarding of traders. The rice same. You know, four people, biggest rice dealers. control has the monopoly over the rice and the consumer suffers the producer rice my boss i i was taking up the position that there should be government intervention no doubt the market is there government intervention at some some point not to allow the prices to go up but government never took the, those steps they made the term they, they came and signed an agreement with the rice dealers no we will not or or and about that about having done that they surreptitiously stored all rice and chewed up the price so the government had to go and so this is only a temporary measure it means it i mean immediately after the i mean by by by, by next two weeks it will be lifted this is not a permanent thing but the media has played out of promotion and say that we are going back to all uh, scarcity and there is nothing there fresh enough food it have vegetables it have fish nothing to worry this all good there's no scarcity at all this because they because then when there's a lockdown there's no way of transporting here and there it's restricted and so therefore that situation was made do so by the orders that is what really happened so it's a temporary measure yeah. nothing to scare it will be we i'll be the first to oppose it if they continue to you the emergency so that is very very reassuring i think coming from you the fact that uh, you are you 
that this is something which is purely temporary and taken to improve the current state of uh, economic management and the food stocks are sufficient and there is uh, not really something very serious to worry about. This is something which, which really I think will soothe the sentiments of a lot of uh, people who are looking anxiously at Sri Lanka from outside Sri Lanka. And even those within Sri Lanka will derive substantial comfort uh, from what you see. So, sir, I'm just trying to uh, bring you up into a few other questions that have come for uh, the discussion. And one of these is uh, with respect to India and specifically the relationship between India and Sri Lanka. Now, uh, we, we are looking at, of course, uh, a condition which has been largely influenced by the COVID-19 pandemic and a number of other regional developments. But between India and Sri Lanka at this stage, what do you think are the next steps that should come in so far as their economic and bilateral engagement becomes stronger and deeper? And if one looks at it as a, as a soft power story, then what might be the elements of that soft power? Our foreign policy is non-aligned policy. And non-aligned means because there's a slight difference uh, with, with regard to the interpretation of the uh, non-aligned by the, the liberal democracy and the social democracy. But certain uh, non-aligned, to use the term used by former Prime Minister Bandar Naik, dynamic neutralism. But reserving the right to take some certain positions on certain issues. Now, for example, as a Palestine issue, whether America get angry or anything, we have to be, we support Palestinian. Palestinian. I mean, similarly, in another issue, we have the right. But power blocks, of course, we won't take. Now, India is our relation, China is our closest friend. That's the difference. We have best of relations. At the opposition level now, our left movement has close relations with the left, the Indian left movement. Similarly, the bourgeois parties have their relationship with the bourgeois party. They're, so they both, the segments, they, they wouldn't like the relation between Sri Lanka and India to be disrupted. You now, historically, there are some certain issues which have been unsolved, which is a really irksome and being uh, some disturbances both to Sri Lanka and say, for instance, Tamil Nadu. It's a Tamil Nadu factor. You know, our chief minister of Tamil Nadu has never visited Sri Lanka. No one knows, excepting I, <laughs> probably. And our chief minister, or our, our president or prime minister, except to go on pilgrimage to Tamil Nadu, you know, relation to Tamil Nadu. I, I was during my Rajapaksa regime. I was the acting foreign minister for, two, for five years when the, the foreign minister was already in the, outside, in the air, going all over the world. So, I had, so we had best of relations. I, I was the only minister who visited Tamil Nadu. I was received well by, I visited, I met all the political leaders, Tamil Nadu, Anna DMK, DMK, two communist parties, everything. So I think that is, I have been even telling my, both presidents and present prime president, I, I didn't get the opportunity to tell him, we must establish at the people's level with the relation between Tamil Nadu. If that is, then the, that is the, one of the things that we will have to promote. There is a problem for the center in the government, Indian government, Indian government. But today the situation in Tamil Nadu is different. The whole original leaders have dead and gone. Situation has different. But we have best of relations. There's no question about it. And the economic relations, now they say, we first go to India and we wanted to stop. So we didn't go to China. We got twice shops from India. And, and, and then we went to Bangladesh. After that only, we went to China. So I said, and India is also a developing country. India has its own problems. India is not as developed as China, no doubt. 
there's a there's a limit to it they can help us but there's a vast big indian population in our country indian origin and also tamil historically i mean there are relations even say that even singhali people had come from kerala the kerala people and sri lanka some communities are they wear the same sarong same uh, eat the same polsam bol and all that same thing so we are just relations so all the political parties of the view that we must maintain our relations okay maybe there may be this doesn't matter for us china has its own reservations with the with the relation with the india problem don't forget the fact that this mrs bandarna and who went to tuscan and had discussion with the prime minister of india and prime minister of china and stopped the border clashes since that there was no after that there were no border clashes it is sri lanka it in between we had we persuaded china prime minister and we persuaded indian prime minister so let us be permit us to play that role in the interest of asia in the interest of south east south asia we have good relation with bangladesh we have good relation with pakistan i don't know what is going to happen in africa afghanistan yet to come but on maldives and even even uh, even uh, 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 all other all south asian countries so there's no question about that we will stick to the non aligned policy and it may be sometimes sometimes friends come to the assistance before uh, the relations friends come to the assistance before the relations it may happen <laughs> that is another question so uh, i am i am mindful of the fact that we are slowly uh, coming to an end of this discussion i mean it's been really really fascinating uh, listening to you and learning from you uh, we still have quite a few questions that have been raised by the participants but i think given the time that we have with us now we probably would take just two of these questions before we end so the first of these questions sir and again uh, this is a view that has come from uh, some of the scholars participants and a general reflection of the fact that uh, during during the pandemic period uh, there has probably been uh, what what some scholars have described as a bit of democratic backsliding in the sense that there is some big breakdown of law and order the the, the delays in the elections but on the whole there is also this view that the rajapaksa regime has been uh, putting up a spirited fight against the pandemic and trying to manage it as best as possible during the first one year so how would you actually assess the government's performance on managing the pandemic sir you know the pandemic as as can i can i have my some personal experience because the president among all party leaders once even after the pandemic i openly told him and of in the presence of all the cabinet ministers in the prime minister and all that emilia i said you got 69 lakhs of people voted for you we are facing i i told him we are facing triple crisis world economic crisis domestic economic crisis and the covid combined if we have combined effect on the on us and i said first thing is that you must appraise the situation and enlighten the people with the with the situation obtained with they do not know what the external economic crisis or the covid crisis first thing is that explain to the people and half the people will back you once enlightened that should be the modus operandi i think he did not take up my word so here if he had done it half the problems would not come up some of the people they are not really the order majority of the sri lankan people do not know that there is an economic economic crisis 
the gravity of the covid they don't know so that is the failure on the part of the government to apprise the people keep the people informed and that can be done then i told him that i drew his attention to when i was a cabinet minister in the global financial crisis 2008 which went on till about 2013 at that time we told prime minister and prime minister had a three day workshop for the parliament mps getting all the top economists to address and say in enlighten them and that paid dividends my main thing is the half the problems present day generation in the political generation who are understanding that half the problem arises because we don't keep the people informed and we have a media all over the world behaving in the same pattern huh? they are only bent on making money that's all advertising making money that happens throughout the world there's another question that i will leave it out at that time so that is the precisely why the people should be kept informed then people will get the support when you get the support don't get the support they come out of the streets then march against the doctors the nurses they don't know i mean see the our doctor we got about 20000 doctors and nurses and we have yet 67000 patients covid patients in the hospitals they look after them when and the people don't have, they don't have an understanding about it if they don't have understanding is the fault of the government half the problems can be solved if there's a proper understanding between people and the government there's a style of governance that is i i told first our president is not a politician yet yeah. is trying to be a politician i hope he will if once for mahindra rajapaksa says not that mahindra rajapaksa he is a well you know he knows the feel he knows the feel the pulse of the people uh, so that is really at not that is a not a deliberate attempt on the part of that as some media and trying to paint out oh is trying to be a dictator and will remain and all the rest of it after he is from political family and he is man of fire sympathy i i have faith in you 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 won so he sort of so therefore nothing to get worried about as sir we are concerned we will not uh, permit any any other uh, un- situation to develop to put it plainly yeah so uh... on this if i could just ask you the very last question as an extension of what you mentioned that uh, some economic and political issues have been brought under the control of the military lately now does this in any way impact sri lanka's external image and have an impact on foreign relations i i you uh, in any way anxious of that uh, i don't think you know that really as a matter of you know i mean our army is not that our, our army don't compare our army with the pakistan army pakistan have a western interest our army does not have western interest our army have, all the top leader around us are from poor christian families that they are patriotic people they may be here and there we had some armed people earlier who staged the coup in 1962 who were trained in britain and they were they were recruited by the british and they are the people who stayed the coup against mrs bandar rai so we don't have that type of army so they have people have know who they are they also know who would be a people our country there is no room for dictatorship or anything else we be from the left movement the working class movement and the progressive movement the social liberal people belong to the social liberal we let be careful of liberal democracy not the social democracy if at all the resort to repressive is that it will come from liberal democracy not from social democracy that is my experience so i uh, really really think it's been absolutely fascinating absolutely wonderful uh, listening to you and uh, 
I, I realize that we just have uh, under uh, five minutes to go before we conclude the program. So uh, what I'll probably do is that I would uh, take this opportunity of having uh, heard from you on so many interesting aspects relating to Sri Lanka and just put it in the perspective of the fact that I think what you shared with us today was a very frank, candid, uh, one might even call it no holds barred description of the current challenges that are facing Sri Lanka. There's no denying the fact that the basket of these challenges is, is very profound. Most of the challenges are very serious. And the job is not being made any easier by the COVID-19 pandemic uh, that is prevailing uh, in the region with, with uh, signs of vacillating, fluctuating, and taking different turns at various points in time. But I think your talk also makes it abundantly clear that looking ahead, uh, there is actually not much cause for despondency in the sense that the government does have options. And as you make it very clear, that much as there are difficulties and the choices could well be difficult, they might uh, involve some, some specific hardships, particularly when it comes to the question of taxes or accessing foreign exchange reserves, choosing the sources of foreign support as far as finances are concerned. There might be some very specific choices that the Sri Lankan government might have to make. And every choice has a price, as we know, insofar as crisis management is concerned. So some price might have to be paid. But on the whole, uh, there is probably a greater fear among the external community, among the current conditions in Sri Lanka, than what they actually are on the ground. And I think I take a particular solace in the fact that you alluded to this latest uh, announcement on food emergency being something which is largely of a temporary nature and also alluding to the fact that uh, much as there are many constraints, the government is committed to a program of turning around the economy to the best of its ability. So on behalf of all of us uh, at the Institute of Salvation Studies, I would like to very deeply and sincerely Thank you for your time. Thank you so much for sharing your insights and wisdom with us here today. And we really hope to stay and engage with you in future. Uh, Thank you, Dr. Thanks. I take into account all your views. Uh, very benefic very beneficial to me, us as well. Uh, enlighten us uh, on the, uh, as far as uh, certain issues are concerned. Your view wide. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I fully appreciate, appreciate and thank you very much once again for having given this uh, opportunity to meet to this wonderful e evening uh, <laughs> spend with you. Thank you. It's, it's entirely our pleasure, sir. And now I would like to return the floor to my colleague, Shavinya. Shavinya, it's yours. Uh, thank you everyone for your presence in today's lecture. We hope to see you at the second lecture. Sri Lanka Foreign Policy and International Relations this Thursday, 9th September at 3 p.m. You can register for the event at our ISAS and US website. Thank you and have a great evening.